Hi, I'm Neil McIver of McIver Capital Management at Canaccord Genuity. And today we're going to talk about a very critical portfolio management technique that we use at McIver Capital Management, and you should be using as well too, to protect the value inside of your portfolio. That technique is rebalancing your portfolio on a regular basis. Institutions know to do this every year. Um, we do it every year for our clients. Individuals on a regular basis miss this critical component, and it's very important to the long-term rate of return of your portfolio, but also to protect the value of your por portfolio, particularly in times of high volatility like we're living through currently. So the first important consideration that needs to be understood by investors is that all, port all, all parts of a portfolio, all the different asset classes, have long-term rates of return that remain relatively consistent from one decade and one generation to the next decade or next generation. For instance, U.S. large cap growth um, stocks have a long-term rate of return of around about 12% that's relatively consistent decade to decade. Canadian equities have a long-term rate of return of about 8%. Um, on a regular basis, on, and that's consistent decade by, by decade. So if you get a, a larger rate of return than that over a period of time, let's say you get 15 or 20 percent or even 30 percent over two or three or four years in any one of those asset classes, probably and most likely that asset class is going to fall in value and take that growth away in order to return to the long-term um, rate of return that that asset class generally provides. And that's called market normalization. And market normalization is just a part of nature. In fact, normalization is just is one of the most powerful uh, concepts in nature. That's why we don't have trees that are 1,000 feet tall. Everything normalizes over time. And what the rebalance does is it takes advantage of that natural movement of asset classes to return to their normalized long-term rates of return. So perhaps the best way to explain this concept uh, so that it's clear to the individuals to take a look at a very simplistic example of how we can take advantage of market normalization to protect the value and enhance the value of your portfolio. So imagine you build a portfolio that is 50% stocks and then it's 50% bonds. Now this is just hypothetical, it's not real, but imagine that's the portfolio that you're comfortable with that matches your um, level of risk that you're willing to accept. And let's say in year one, after building that portfolio, equities have a great year. And not because bonds have gone down, but only because stocks have gone up. You've, your portfolio is now 75% stocks and 25% bonds. Now, most individuals are going to leave that distortion inside of their portfolio because they're happy that their portfolio went up and they'll probably hope that that will continue. Institutions won't do that. The Kyber Capital Management, we don't do that either going to harvest those gains. So what we're going to do is we're going to sell down the equities and we're going to buy bonds with that excess growth that we've had on the equity side of the portfolio. And by doing that, we bring the portfolio back to its 50-50 structure so that it matches the level of risk that we were willing to take in day one. So imagine year two rolls around and you've taken those gains and you've banked them in the bond section of your portfolio and it's a terrible year. All of a sudden, the stock market collapses like it did in, say, 2020. It was down 37% or 2008, where it fell 57%. And that same portfolio is now 75% bonds, not because bonds rose in value, but because stocks fell. Well, first of all, you're going to be very happy that you took the profits the year before and banked those on the bond side of the portfolio. But what we would do at that point in time is we would actually buy equities. Now, most individuals would not do that. They'd be scared. They would think that the world is over and, and that they don't want to own any more equities because they've, they've fallen in value. But by doing an automatic and mechanical rebalance, we remove the emotion and we buy the equity. So we take the, the excess cash that we've got uh, on the bond side and we buy equities. And by doing that, we're going to be buying equities at a low. And even if the market continues to correct, we can continue the next year to rebalance and continually buy the equities while they're at a low. 
And again, eventually that's going to reverse. The market, each one of the markets or the components of the portfolio will normalize, will reinflate, and we've been buying low and we're, we've been selling high. That's effectively what um, a, an annual rebalance achieves for an individual investor and for all investors. This is exactly why institutions do this. Now let's look at a real world example here. This table um, shows asset returns of 11 different assets going back to 2010 and how they did on a relative basis to each other. The asset classes at the top are the ones that have done the best. The asset classes at the bottom are the ones on a relative basis that have done the worst. So let's get a little bit more complex potential portfolio to consider and that would be one where you own 11 different asset classes and each one you own equally. So you would own 9% in each one of these different asset classes. So if we go and we look at 2015, what we can see is the worst performing um, asset class in that particular year was emerging market stocks. The second worst performing asset class in that particular year was commodities, both of them down around about 14%. The top performing asset class was US, uh, uh, the S&P 500 growth, which are large cap growth stocks. So what would we do at the end of that particular year when we went to rebalance? Well, what we, we would be doing at that point in time is we would be buying commodities, buying emerging markets, and you can see gold down there. We'd be adding gold to the portfolio as well too, and we would be taking some profits on the top performing assets at the top. Then we move on to 2016. Emerging market stocks have now done 11%. So we bought, remember, we bought them down here and we added, and, and, and now they've, we've been rewarded for that because they did 11% in 2016. Gold did 8%, commodities did 12%. All those assets did very well. And you can see down below it, um, the S&P 500 has underperformed those assets that we added. If we move on to 2017, Emerging markets have done did 37% in that year. So again, we were rewarded for buying emerging markets down there uh, at, the, at the very, very bottom. And um, what would we be doing at the end of 2017? At the end of 2017, we would be taking profits on emerging market stocks and the S&P 500 growth, which are US large cap growth stocks. And we would be buying cash and government bonds down here because that's the worst performing asset. Remember, we're returning everything back to the original 9% in each one of the asset classes. We move on to 2018. What's happened? Top performing asset class is cash, which we added to the previous year. The second performing asset class in that year are government bonds, again, which we added to that year. The worst performing asset class is the one that we took profits on, emerging market stocks down 14% right there. And uh, we also took profits on S&P 500 growth, uh, which did effectively zero. But you can see how market normalization is going to regularly um, uh, be able to reduce your risk, take profits, it effectively forces you to sell high and buy low each and every single year. Let's look at a more recent example. And we can see in 2020 and 2021, the top performing asset class is the S&P 500 growth, which are US large cap growth stocks. That's primarily driven by FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Top performing asset class in each one of those years. Remember the long-term rate of return of that asset class is about 12. It's not 33 and it's not 32%. So at some point in time, that asset class is gonna give that back. So what would we do at the end of each one of those years is we would be taking profits on the S&P 500 growth and we'd be buying cash and we'd be buying US value stocks. And then as we move into 2021, S&P 500 growth remains very profitable, but what's beginning to start to perform? The S&P 500 value stocks. So those stocks uh, which we added at the end of the previous year um, and then cash of course um, uh, does about as well as it probably would be expected to. As we move in to 2022, what's happened? The profits that we've taken on the S&P 500 have gone into cash, they've gone into value stocks, they've gone into bonds, and we've seen a very significant correction in US large cap growth stocks. So all of those FANG stocks, NASDAQ, 
uh, top to bottom fell a little bit over 20% in that time frame. Again, proving out the concept that these asset classes always return to their long-term rates of return and that market normalization continually happens. And by making sure that we're doing this on an annual basis, it's mechanical, it's not an emotional decision. We're removing emotion from the investment process and mechanically we are selling high and we're buying low. And that is going to impact the rates of return inside of your portfolio. Now, finally, studies show how often um, you should um, rebalance is potentially different from one year to the next. But most studies show that if you annually rebalance, that's probably the most effective um, time frame or interval uh, in, which to, uh, in which to rebalance your portfolio. Thanks for watching, folks. I understand that this concept is a little bit complex, but if you're interested in professional portfolio management, please click the link below for access to an exclusive in-depth video on how we manage portfolios professionally.